introducing our most exciting season yet, Overwatch 2 Invasion. New story missions, new PvP game mode, new support hero. You can get started on your mission to save the world with Overwatch 2 Invasion Bundle for 15 USD. Permanent access to Overwatch 2's Invasion Story Missions? You have to pay for permanent access to the PvE mode? The PvE mode they gutted the replayability of by scrapping hero talents and hero progression? You deprive us of May being able to roll over enemies in a snowball, Rhine's 360 Earth Shatter, and have the audacity to charge us $15 if we even want to have a little taste of what could have been? <laughs> so let's talk about man versus machine. If it wasn't clear, I have mixed feelings towards Overwatch 2. If I were to go into detail about all of my negative feelings towards the game, we'd be here for a long time. Meanwhile, here's everything I like about Overwatch 2. Yeah, I still play this godforsaken game. I'm part of the problem. But since this game still has me in a vice grip, I think I'm in the position to be able to criticize the hell out of it by apparently doing what I do best and talking about how how TF2 did it better. And just to give you a quick overview of my time and experience for both games, so you guys know I'm not talking out the ass end of wiki articles, uh, I've been drenched in the communities of both games for years. I picked up TF2 just after Man vs. Machine was added back in 2012, and, well, I, I feel like I don't have to go into any more detail considering the state of my channel. With Overwatch, I've been playing since open beta back in 2016. I've experienced all of Overwatch's garbage metas from Goats, to Double Shield, to Moth, to Ironclad Bastion, and good old Mick right click at the beginning of the game's life. Uh, I've seen the ups and downs of this entire game. Uh, thousands of hours has been spent on each game, on different modes, and different skill levels of both games. Do you want to know how to tell I'm obsessed with the property? I cosplay characters from them. I spend time and money outside of the game, putting together costumes I don't even get to use outside of conventions. I'm not some e-girl coming in to complain for clout or fully shilling for Valve. At the heart of everything, I genuinely love both games, and the complaints you see here regarding Overwatch 2's PvE mode are coming from a place of frustration and disappointment for not just PvE, but really the entire franchise. So, PvE, what is it? By definition, player versus environment, often abbreviated to PvE, is a game type in which players fight AI-controlled enemies. Player versus player, or PvP, on the other hand, are when a player or team of players face off against other real people. The latter of these are what the main game modes that both TF2 and Overwatch 2 focus on. It's all about that sweet, dominating glory over little Jose Gonzalez 2007. Holy hell, he's probably in like 16 by now. In terms of PvE, TF2 has Man vs. Machine, a mode in which six players team up to face waves of mostly predetermined robots. At least, that's the gist of it. Uh, we'll get into the more meaty parts of it throughout this video. Now, Overwatch has had its fair share of PvE modes throughout its years. PvE was always used as a limited time seasonal mode. It exists for like two weeks and then be gone until it ultimately returned the following year. But, that's not the PvE we're talking about. Oh no, we may hearken back to it occasionally, uh, but we're focusing on the PvE that added that meaningless 2 to Overwatch, and was the justification for its existence in the first place. Overwatch 2's main selling point was an extensive PvE campaign of story missions that was meant to push a stagnant story forward, give characters who were isolated since conception the chance to truly interact with the rest of the cast, and most importantly from a gameplay standpoint, the ability to customize your hero's abilities in new ways to crush the Omnic Crisis. Sounds pretty good, huh? Even if lore isn't quite your thing, you could probably still get behind the chance to try out variations of a hero's abilities, even if it was tied to only the PvE mode. So let's see here. This is what was pitched to us in terms of PvE. And this is what we've ended up with. 
Now, there are a lot of details regarding the history of Overwatch 1 and 2 in terms of the treatment and regards to PvE that I will have to skim over for the sake of time. The basics of it, though, are that Overwatch 1 was left to rot with little to no content or attention until the launch of Overwatch 2 in late 2022. Under the explanation that most of their team was focused on working on this big PvE expansion. Come to find out in a huge Walk of Shame podcast streamed eight months post-launch, as well as in an interview, the devs came out and said that it was completely scaled back. We, we can't deliver on that original vision for PvE that was shown in 2019. Is that we won't be delivering that dedicated hero mode with talent trees, um, that long-term power progression. Uh, those things just aren't in our plans anymore. And it was confirmed again that the PvE would be doled out as seasonal content. Uh, the latter of which was stated near the beginning of the game's life, with the reasoning that they didn't want to hoard the content. So what's the big problem here? Replayability. And what does MVM shine in? Replayability. Are you, are you starting to see the concept of this video? But first, I do need to clarify something. When comparing these two modes, I'm going to only be comparing the content MVM had on its initial release. This means no maps, upgrades, and items from the Mecha update and the Two Cities update. Even if this video is mostly criticizing Overwatch 2's PvE, I still want the comparisons to be fair. Since MVM was given a lot of quality of life additions to the modes post-release, and Overwatch hasn't even gotten out their first batch. So yes, a lot of things regarding Overwatch will be inferring and taking information from official sources as well as looking back at their history of PvE treatment. I will also not be touching on the sheer insane amount of community-created content there is for MVM. The community has created some amazing things over the years, but it doesn't have a place in this video. What defines replayability? Uh, particularly replayability in a PvE mode that's an offshoot of a game's main type of gameplay. I think it can be boiled down to three words. Variety, rewarding, and accessibility. Let's break these down. Variety! A PvE mode is inherently a more difficult style of game to make replayable. I'd liken it closer to how difficult single-player games can be to insert methods that make players want to replay it, as opposed to PvP, which is arguably the easiest due to outcomes and experiences differing wildly between games, simply because it's players interacting with each other. It's why I think rogue lights slash likes are such a popular genre nowadays. The nature of the genre makes it so that even though it's a limited nature, it's a forced cyclical game style that makes it inherently replayable because the player is forced to replay parts of the game numerous times. But I'm getting off topic. One of the ways to integrate variety into the game is player customization. Since PvE doesn't have to be balanced like a PvP mode, a game doesn't really have to care about balance as much. MVM's answer to this is the upgrade station. While the upgrades can seem a bit basic, such as things like fire rate increases or clip size increases, players have the ability to add them individually to every weapon, as well as the mercenary's beautiful bodies. Though body upgrades are mainly resistances to different damage types, there are also silly things like 20% more jump height and 10% more glorious movement speed per level bot. The ability to add upgrades adds a lot of replayability because you could do something like play a standard money collecting scout who's been pumped full of resistances in order to survive the onslaught of attempted death for one game, but then in another, you can invest into beasting out your shortstop to absolutely shred anything and everything that comes into its path. By allowing creativity, you instantly gain replayability. So Overwatch PvE lost its upgrade station. Yeah, everything tied to the hero missions that Blizzard ultimately scrapped was their equivalent of the MVM upgrade station, except it persisted between games. Didn't like May stationary popsicle used to stall, defend, and heal normally? Turn it into a winter version of the Indiana Jones boulder to roll down your enemies. Look, I really like this specific idea, all right? So, what variety is Overwatch 2's story missions going to offer? Who knows? Likely none, because hero missions were all the variety! The replacement for hero missions is Hero Mastery, which are obstacle courses tailored specifically for individual heroes 
in order to test your finesse in their kit. We don't even know how many heroes are receiving this alongside the first batch of story missions. But the language is clear! Selection of heroes! And you know what? I'm gonna throw Blizzard the tiniest bone I can. They're, they're getting the staps. Their initial vision of PvE back in 2019 was overambitious. They stated that each hero would have 40 talents. That is an insane amount of work for what was 33 playable characters at the time if you include the newly announced Sojourn. I can absolutely see the reasoning for scrapping such a massive undertaking. But the issue is, they scrapped all of it. It wouldn't have been the best outcome, but it certainly would have been an understandable one if they scrapped the skill trees and focused on the skill variants. That would have at least given players something to play around with in the story missions, aka a reason to replay them. These skills were never going to be used outside of PvE, so they wouldn't have needed heavy and constant balancing like the PvP mode. Except, they almost certainly used some in 2023's April Fool's mode. Widow's one-shot being removed for venomous damage over time? That screams ability variant. A conspiracy aside, the biggest question is, why get rid of something that you only needed to make for the characters being used in that set of story missions? Different types of missions also help with variety, and this is something both actually tackle decently. For MVM, it's missions that change up the bot waves and types within a map. For Overwatch, it's challenges that change up the rule set, such as only close range damage, only headshot damages enemies, etc. This is an aspect that is really subjective as to which type of enemy variety you want. Uh, do you want rules that affect every single enemy equally? Or do you want different variations based off the mission you choose? Leaderboards can also fall under variety. Something that fuels a lot of competitive players is seeing those rank numbers increase, seeing themselves move up on the leaderboard, proving they have skill. The leaderboards for Overwatch's PvEs have always been built around team score and ranking based on the difficulty you play at. Higher difficulty naturally equals a higher score. Leaderboards for the story missions are said to be permanent, so there will be some form of ranking. In theory, speed running the story missions should be possible, uh, but that's not a widely enjoyed style of playing the game for a lot of people. Hell, people HAVE speed ran the Archives missions, despite the fact that they had two to four weeks out of the year where they even had a chance to practice and submit times. But hey, if you can speedrun MVM of all things, you can probably find ways to speedrun the story missions. And this is where I'd show my rewards. My hard work! When we spend money, we want something in return. This can be an enjoyable time, a physical or virtual product, anything that someone values. When I spend money on a game, I want it to feel worth it especially if it's a free-to-play game. When you choose to man up, you have to pay one 99 cent ticket per mission. Finishing a mission, in the original update, got you one standard unique weapon. Not the best reward for most, but it was still something. Finishing the Lone Tour, Operation Oil Spill, would get you either an exclusive cosmetic or a bot killer variant of a weapon. You got something, even if, and I can't believe I'm saying this, even if you are essentially gambling. Yes, the rewards are randomized from a loot pool. You may not get the item you want, but you're guaranteed something. Skyman does not condone gambling. Then again, this is just the pay-to-play version that physically rewards you with a virtual item for spending your time and money on it. MVM has a bunch of achievements that, while meaningless to some, could be things for others to chase. It only has one real reward, which is the power-up canteen uh, that's basically a mandatory item in the game mode. This item is unlocked after fully completing one mission. 
I can see Overwatch 2's story missions also having a handful of achievements with potentially some sort of reward tied to them. But knowing their track record, it's likely to be something along the lines of a voice line or a souvenir. Maybe one skin, but this is all just speculation based on history. I think the main thing Overwatch is rewarding players for buying into the PvE is the lore. And there's a pretty big problem with that. You guys remember that infamous interview from Masahiro Sakurai where he talks about why no Smash game has had a true story mode since Brawl? Unfortunately, the movie scenes we worked hard to create were uploaded onto the internet. You can only truly wow a player the first time he sees. I felt if players saw the cutscenes outside of the game, they would no longer serve as rewards for playing the game, so I've decided against having them. This isn't inherently wrong. While this being the sentiment for not creating more story modes like Subspace Emissary is pretty dumb, the main point he tried to make was right. Cutscenes are cutscenes. They're tiny movies that once released can be recorded and uploaded on the internet for all to see. Are you one of the people who just wants to see the story? Want to see all the character interactions that can occur? Just look them up. You don't have to play the game to satiate the hunger. But that's what some of the reward for playing the story missions are. An actual story. I genuinely think Sakurai's sentiment really hits here. People have been waiting at least four years to see where the Overwatch 2 announcement cinematic went. But with the broken promises, relatively high price of entry, gutted mode, and seasonal droppings, what's to stop people from just watching content creators play through the mode? And you know, the paywall is a huge problem. We knew PvE wouldn't be free from the beginning. However, in the beginning, we were promised a much larger, much more extensive, complete experience that no longer exists. I guarantee you people, including myself, would have been fine spending 60 or $70 on a complete story campaign, especially with how much replay value the introduced systems would have given. But putting out something people are already incredibly disappointed in, when there is nothing showing confidence that these aren't just extended archive-like missions, and where you still have to pay money to play it, is no bueno. I genuinely have not been able to think of another free-to-play game that locks an entire game mode behind a paywall. Fortnite's extensive creative mode is free, and Save the World doesn't count since it was the original game mode that was a game with a price tag. Apex Legends just has exorbitant cosmetics for sale, and all their gameplay aspects are free. The only thing I can think of is TF2's in-game competitive mode. Comp requires users to accomplish one of two requirements. One, have a premium account, which means purchase literally anything from the store or use a premium gift item, have a phone number that's verified, and be level 3 and casual. The second is Buying a matchmaking pass from the store for 10 bucks. The second more pricey version was obviously created to deter cheaters and alt accounts from accessing the mode, since the first set of requirements is pretty standard for most players. If anyone has an example of a free-to-play game that has an exclusive game mode locked behind opening your wallet, I'd really like to know. Speaking of paywall... Accessibility! In the context of this video, accessibility asks the question, how easy is it for a player to access a PvE mode? And look, this is pretty straightforward. Man vs. Machine is available for free, and Overwatch 2 story missions are not. But I gotta give more detail than that. I'm a long-winded person who constantly receives gust in my sails to keep my motor mouth running, so I make sure to cover all my bases when talking and comparing two things that are unfortunately frequently compared because one tends to fail aspects that are shared between the two. MVM is split into two modes, Bootcamp and Man Up. Bootcamp is the free version. Bootcamp does not give you a reward at the end of a mission or tour. The only thing MVM locks behind a paywall are the rewards. Overwatch has a creator workshop, and in the past, 
PvE modes have been available for people to play outside of the normal queues. But due to the fact the story missions are being paywalled, it's probably safe to assume players won't be able to access them in a similar way. And that's the biggest problem with Overwatch 2's PvE. None of it's going to be accessible without a fee. Not sure you're gonna enjoy the experience the mode provides, but you'll want to give it a shot? Too bad. You either pay to try it out, or you don't play it at all. Currently, the first batch of three missions are only stated to be available in a bundle that costs 15 USD. Overwatch 2 is huge on bundles, and at this time, they haven't stated that you can buy access outside of the bundle. Not everyone cares about the rest of the bundle, especially since one of the perks is literally useless to anyone that isn't brand new to the game. Which, as an additional detail, this transaction is only for the first three missions. All subsequent missions are going to require you to shell out even more money to line the pockets of the executive's fleet of yachts. <sighs> Look, to those of you who came here to hear me sing the praises of MVM, I'm sorry you had to sit through so much negativity regarding Overwatch 2's PvE, but the fact of the matter was, this was always going to be more of a discussion of that as opposed to MVM. The reaction from the beginning was genuine rage. I mean, the voice recording came after, but my reaction to the continued news of PvE was legitimately an entire night of rage-induced script writing. Six hatred-filled pages were rewritten and then heavily reworked into what you just saw. So if anything, count yourself lucky. I went back and reworked what I originally had, because let me tell you, it was so much worse. Man vs. Machine should be the model that all free-to-play games that introduce permanent PvE modes follow. It's accessible to everyone, still has a form of monetization that is ultimately optional, and it rewards you when you decide to spend money on it. There really don't seem to be that many attempts at free-to-play games creating permanent game modes that fall far outside of their usual gameplay style. This is why I used the beaten-to-death comparison of TF2 and Overwatch, because there really wasn't any other game I could compare it to. This isn't a call to go play MVM, but rather to show that a PvE mode in a free-to-play PvP game can be successfully implemented. Overwatch 2 could have had it if their execution ended up being closer to the original vision. But greed, the changing of hands, and the tiring games-as-a-service model has destroyed what could have been an amazing PvE experience. God, I'm so tired of hopelessly enjoying neglected properties. Wow, looks like I've still got some patrons around. Special thanks to Trey Windenall for being an investor. Additional thanks to Jorge Aiza, Julian Arnott, Mueke Kiryu, and Sean O'Mahony.